Hello, and welcome to another session of the Rousseau Report. I'm your host, Dennis Rousseau. Today, we're going to address life cycles. A frog? Human? How about business jet life cycles? Planning, acquisition, operation, and maintenance. And finally, disposal or decommissioning, or end of life. And hopefully, this addresses a couple of issues regarding pricing of legacy aircraft in today's market. Business aviation is a complex industry between design, flight testing, flight operations, maintenance, ever-changing regulations, aging aircraft issues. It's a huge endeavor. A clean sheet design can cost up to $1 billion and take years of R&D and thousands of hours of flight testing to obtain certification. And that's a major reason OEMs continue with an aircraft model using the same type certificate year over year and simply rebranding. The CJ4 went to the CJ4 Gen 2 the Challenger 350 to the 3500, and the list goes on. Similar case with the Bombardier 600 series, where there are over 1,000 aircraft in service, and all are tied to the same type certificate from the 1970s. <clears throat> Although the engines and avionics have been upgraded over the years, this was done via STC, or Supplemental Type Certificate, as was the addition of a fuel tail tank to boost the range from 3,200 to 3,800 miles. And all 600 series have the same long range cruise speeds, certified ceiling of 41,000 feet, and that list goes on. The same holds true for Cessna's Excel. It's been in production for 25 years. And when they're parked next to each other, similar to the Challenger 600 series, it's very difficult to tell them apart. Yet Cessna delivered over a thousand aircraft. What's interesting is the fact that they all share the same fuselage and cabin and have similar range profiles. However, when you look at the engines, all Pratt & Whitney Canada, the XL has the 545As, the XLS, the 545Bs, and the XLS Plus, the Cs. And just as you would think, that's the end of the production run, Cessna just made the announcement they're replacing the XLS Plus with the Ascend that looks identical to the XLS. But they've incorporated 15% larger windows, Garmin 5000 avionics, and the Pratt & Whitney Canada 540D engines and a flat floor, eliminating the three and a half inch trough. So dig this. You now have a cabin height of five feet, two inches, or as an option, you can elect to leave the trough. Boy, I talk about rebranding. Going back to the cost for a clean sheet design. I believe Cessna is doing the exact same, same thing as Bombardier with the Challenger 300, 350, 3500, the Global 6000, 6500, Embraer's Legacy 450 or Praetor 500. All share the same type certificate and then are simply rebranded through STC. Do they incorporate new material in the build process to address corrosion or new components with unlimited life? No, these aircraft are going to age just like their 25 year old predecessors. Aircraft such as the Gulfstream G500, the Falcon 6X, both clean sheet designs that on average can take up to eight years and thousands of hours in flight testing to receive certification. During conceptual design, the process starts with the aircraft's purpose or mission, one that will fit into its intended category economically and incorporate superior performance relative to the competition. If it's designed in the ultra long range category, it should carry crew and passengers for a six, 7,000 mile mission, and the galley should be designed to accommodate a 14 hour trip. Then we get into preliminary and detailed design and start building models. And then wind tunnel testing. This happens to be a Boeing 777, but you get the idea is this is where we define performance and handling, proof of concept. Once the engines are selected, they go through rigorous testing for icing and performance before they've be even been affixed to the airframe. Now think of the cost involved to hire a Boeing 747, then strap the engine to the side of the fuselage and fly around for hundreds of hours, and you even ha haven't even used it on the actual aircraft yet. When aircraft are in the preliminary design phase, the OEM has to consider what it will take for production, operation, performance, safety and reliability, maintenance, and all this translates into the life cycle of an aircraft. What determines end of life? We'll get to that in a minute. Avionics are another major aspect of design and operation. So we embark on mapping the system out. Which component speaks to the other? How do we integrate all systems into one central repository? Once the wing's defined, it'll be subject to stress tests, where you literally bend and twist this piece of metal every which way. And let me tell you, I've been in a wing test facility, and when it's pushed up and down 45 degrees and you hear the creaking and you assume it's going to snap, 
any minute, but it doesn't. After all this, you see a schematic and get an idea of all the little parts and components that go into building an aircraft. And before you actually fly, you spent three to four years in the design and development phase. I tracked one particular model aircraft from first flight to entry into service, and that process took three years. Keeping in mind, you spent four years in conceptual design and testing, so we've already spent seven years in the process. Now here's the issue. Most of what we've incorporated in building the aircraft is already six to seven years old. And as an OEM, you're going to place a warranty on the airplane, so you need to stock up on spares and support equipment. The very first flight to test the handling qualities, engine vibrations, and noise levels void of an interior. You evaluate the results from a 15-minute flight, address them, then do it again for five hours. And this goes on for avionics and radio testing. Then cold soaks where you test the reliability of flight controls, engines, landing gear, and some of the most extreme temperatures in the world. Typically in North Canada, where aircraft are exposed to minus 50 Celsius overnight to demonstrate the reliability of systems. If an OEM states the aircraft can fly 7,000 nautical miles at 0.85 Mach, which is 14 plus hours, they have to prove it. If they say the aircraft can achieve speeds of 0.9 Mach and altitudes of 51,000, prove it. When you put something in the flight manual, such as best cruise performance, Prove it. Not once, but over and over. From time of first flight, four plus years of proving every part and system on the aircraft, the OEM spending $1 billion, the aircraft enters customer service, and are they getting expensive? The new Falcon 10X has a price tag of 75 million, the G700, 70 million. So now after spending millions of dollars, we have costs of ownership. Fixed costs, which encompass hangar, crew salaries and training, insurance, scheduled maintenance, Navigation software, that list goes on. Then we have direct or variable costs that we incur when we fly the aircraft. Fuel, landing and parking fees, engine, APU and avionics programs. For long range business jets, you'll easily exceed $2 million a year and that excludes depreciation. The first three to five years of an aircraft entering service, practically everything is covered by warranty with the exception of traveling back and forth to the OEM's facility to get service. After the warranties expire, the real cost of operation set in. Let's not forget, during the design phase of building a new aircraft, avionics and cabin management systems are selected, but they don't enter service for another five to seven years. So in effect, they're already six years old. One model aircraft is now reaching 16 years in service. So it's due its second major airframe inspection where the aircraft is basically taken apart, inspected, then put back together. Overhauling the gear at this interval will easily cost $500,000. The airframe inspection, a million. And just when you think we're done, consider this. The cabin management system is now 20 years old and is no longer supported. Cost to replace it, 800,000. Cost new, just north of 42 million. ACPV, 14 million. Price out the door after the 16 year, 3 million plus. At what point do you stop? Inspections are broke down into two categories, calendar and hourly. A-checks tied to the latter and are generally visual inspections, lubrication, operational checks, and these are called out by flight hours, generally in 500-hour increments. Then you get into C-checks that are calendar-related and include functional checks, structural inspections, and the major C-check is performed every eight years or 96 months. One common misconception dealing with maintenance is that each of these inspections is a standalone. They're not. The 1C is accomplished every 12 months, the 2C every 24 months at which time you'll also repeat the 1C, right up to the 8C, which also incorporates a 1, 2, and 4C, in addition to all the 96-month tasks. Cost for the first major inspection? Around 500,000 for a long-range aircraft. But what does the picture look like when we reach the second 8C, or appropriately called the 16C? Now you'll pull the standalone 16C items, which are different in scope than the 8C, typically more intensive, Plus, the 1, 2, 4, and 8C tasks cost a million plus. What about the third 8C? And the aircraft continues to depreciate. Keep in mind, these are scheduled inspections. Then you have those that are unscheduled that involve failures, breakage, premature wear, metal fatigue, and corrosion. And this last item is major in the maintenance world. Recall the Aloha Airlines decompression in April of 1988, involving a Boeing 737-200 that incurred extensive damage after an explosive decompression in flight caused by poor maintenance and metal fatigue. Mind you, this aircraft was operated in a highly corrosive environment. So as not to spread fear, we've come a long way in 30 years.
But with that said, corrosion comes in many forms and shapes and can be found through surface pitting and can grow horizontally or vertically and affect every area of the aircraft. Under antennas, where they attach to the upper and lower fuselage. Drain ports, and this is what the skin will look like before and after if you're employing industry standard maintenance. This is what it should look like. Wing leading edge is another highly corrosive area, so MROs and OEMs are coming up with new ways and materials to address these areas. Now let's turn to our design and life cycle. We'll reach a point in time where the aircraft becomes too costly to operate, regardless of whether it's paid for or not. The aircraft costs exceed the value of the asset. Parts become obsolete or too expensive to repair, and that's when you reach the disposal phase. A Sovereign reached its life cycle long before its time, based on a 2008 year model that cost new plus or minus 16 million. 14 years hence, it's being parted out. A Lear 60, similar situation, but someone found value in the engines. Now in this particular case, as of December 23, the Proline 4 avionics are no longer by, uh, supported by Collins. What do you do when they break and there are no parts? At that juncture, what's the value of the engines? An early uh, Hawker 800 XP, same scenario, only in this case the avionics are worthless as they're the early SPZ 8000. So what do you have remaining? Engines. And once they run out, you end up here. I'm Dennis Russo for the Russo Report. Thanks for tuning in.